Hello, guys. It is Tuesday, March 23rd. 41 days left of the school year. That's not include weekends because we do not go to school on weekends. Actual school days. All right, so we're going to pick back up with Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. Um, we know that Billy is our main character, and we know that this actually takes place in our area of rural Oklahoma here, which is the reason we read it, and we also have the Red Fern Festival. So we're going to continue with chapters three and four today. Um, the chapters get considerably longer after these two, so we'll probably just do one chapter a day till we get to the very end, um, which looks like around the middle of April, 414, and we'll read those last two chapters together and then take our test. All right, so where we left off, we had a little bit of a present day in the first chapter, which is still probably 50 years ago. And then Billy started talking about his past, and we'll stay in that area now. We'll talk about when he's younger and is he going to get the dogs? And if he does, how's he going to get them? So that's where we'll pick up today, chapter three. The dog wanting disease never did leave me altogether. With the new work I was doing helping Papa, it just kind of burned itself down and left a big sore on my heart. Every time I'd see a coon track down in our fields or along the riverbanks, the old sore would get all festered up and start hurting again. Just when I had given up all hope of ever owning a good hound, something wonderful happened. The good Lord figured I'd heard enough and it was time to lend a helping hand. It all started one day while I was hoeing corn down in our field close to the river. Across the river, a party of fishermen had been camped for several days. I heard the old Maxwell car as it snorted and chugged its way out of the bottoms. I knew they were leaving. Throwing down my hoe, I ran down to the river and waded across at a place called the Shannon Ford. I hurried to the campground. It was always a pleasure to prowl where fishermen had camped. I usually could find things, a fish line or a forgotten fish pole. On one occasion, I found a beautiful knife stuck in the bark of a sycamore tree, forgotten by a careless fisherman. But on that day, I found the greatest of treasures, a sportsman's magazine discarded by the campers. It was a real treasure for a country boy. Because of that magazine, my entire life was changed. I sat down on an old sycamore log and started thumbing through the leaves. He means the pages. On the back pages of the magazine, I came to the for sale section, dogs for sale. Every kind of dog. I read on and on. They had dogs I've never heard of, names I couldn't make out. Far down in the right corner, I found an ad that took my breath away. In small letters, it read, registered red bone coon hound pups, $25 each. The advertisement was from McKennell in Kentucky. I read it over and over. By the time I had memorized the ad, I was seeing dogs, hearing dogs, and even feeling them. The magazine was forgotten. I was lost in thought. The brain of an 11-year-old boy can dream some fantastic dreams. How wonderful it would be if I could have two of those pups. Every boy in the country but me had a good hound or two. But $50. How could I ever get $50? I knew I couldn't expect help from Mama and Papa. I remembered a passage from the Bible my mother had read to us. God helps those who help themselves. I thought of the words. I mulled them over in my mind. I decided I'd ask God to help me. There on the banks of the Illinois River in the cool shade of the tall white sycamores, I asked God to help me get two hound pups. It wasn't much of a prayer, but it did come right from the heart. When I left the campground of the fishermen, it was late. As I walked along, I could feel the hard bulge of the magazine jammed deep in the pocket of my overalls. The beautiful silence that follows the setting sun had settled over the river bottoms. The coolness of the rich black soil felt good to my bare feet. It was the time of day when all furry things come to life. A big swamp rabbit hopped on the trail, sat on his haunches, stared at me, and then scampered away. A mother gray squirrel ran out on the limb of a burr oak tree. She barked a warning to the four furry balls behind her. They melted from sight into the thick green. A silent gray shadow drifted down from the top of a tall sycamore. There was a squeal and a beating of wings. I heard the tinkle of a bell in the distance ahead. I knew it was Daisy, our milk cow. I had to start her on her way home. 
Sorry, I had to start her on the way home. I took the magazine from my pocket again and read the ad. Slowly, a plan began to form. I'd save the money. I could sell stuff to the fishermen. Crawfish minnows, fresh vegetables. In berry season, I could sell all the berries I could pick at my grandfather's store. I could trap in the winter. The more I planned, the more real it became. There was the way to get those pups. A way, a real way, save my money. I could almost feel the pups in my hands. I planned the little doghouse and where to put it. Collars, I could make myself. Then the thought came, what could I name them? I tried name after name, voicing them out loud. No, none seemed to fit. Well, there would be plenty of time for names. Right now, there was something more important. $50, a fabulous sum, a fortune, far more money than I had ever seen. Somehow, some way, I was determined to have it. I had 23 cents, a dime I had earned running errands for my grandpa, and 13 cents a fisherman had given me for a can of worms. The next morning, I went to the trash pile behind the barn. I was looking for a can, my bank. So he's thinking like a pee bank. I picked up several, but they didn't seem to be what I wanted. Then I saw it, an old KC baking powder can. It was perfect, long and slender with a good tight lid. I took it down to the creek, scrubbed it with sand until it was bright and new looking. I dropped the 23 cents in the can. The coins looked so small lying there in the shiny bottom, but to me, it was a good start. With my finger, I tried to measure how full it would be with the $50 in it. Next, I went to the barn and up to the loft. Far back over the hay and up under the eaves, I hid my can. I had a start toward making my dreams come true, 23 cents. I had a good bank, safe from the rats and from the rain and snow. All, all through that summer, I worked like a beaver. In the small creek that wormed its way down through our fields, I caught crawfish with my bare hands. I trapped minnows with an old screen wire trap I made myself, baited with yellow cornbread, from my mother's kitchen. These were sold to the fishermen along with fresh vegetables and roasting ears. I tore my way through the black grape patches until my hands and feet were scratched raw and red from the thorns. I tramped the hills seeking out the huckleberry bushes. My grandfather paid me 10 cents a bucket for my berries. Once grandpa asked me what I did with the money I earned. I told him I was saving it to buy some hunting dogs. I asked him if he would order them for me when I had saved enough. He said he would. I asked him not to say anything to my father. He promised me he wouldn't. I'm sure grandpa paid a little attention to my plans. That winter, I trapped harder than ever with the three little traps I owned. Grandpa sold my hides to fur buyers who came to his store all through the first season. Prices were cheap, 15 cents for a large possum hide, 25 for a good skunk hide. Little by little, the nickels and dimes added up. The old KC baking powder can grew heavy. I would heft its weight in the palm of my hand. With a straw, I'd measure from the lip of the can to the money. As the months went by, the straws grew shorter and shorter. The next summer, I would follow the same routine. Would you like to buy some crawfish or minnows? Maybe you'd like some fish. Sorry, some fresh vegetables or roasting ears. The fishermen were wonderful, as true sportsmen are. They seemed to sense the urgency in my voice and always bought my wares. However, Many was the time I'd find my vegetables left in an abandoned camp. There was never a set price. Anything they offered was good enough for me. A year passed. I was 12. I was over the halfway mark. I had $27.46. My spirits soared. I worked harder. Another year crawled slowly by, and then the great day came. The long, hard grind was over. I had it. My $50. I cried as I counted it over and over. As I set the can back in the shadowy eaves of the barn, it seemed to glow with a radiant whiteness I'd never seen before. Perhaps it was, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps it was all imagination. I don't know. Lying back in the soft hay, I folded my hands behind my head, closed my eyes and let my mind wander back over the two long years. I thought of the fishermen, the blackberry patches and the huckleberry hills. I thought of the prayer I had said when I asked God to help me get two hound pups. I knew he had surely helped, for he had given me the heart, courage, and determination. Early the next morning, with the can jammed deep in the pocket of my overalls, I flew to the store. 
As I trotted along, I whistled and sang. I felt as big as the tallest mountains in the Ozarks. Arriving at my destination, I saw two wagons were tied up at the hitching rack. I knew some farmers had come to the store, so I waited until they left. As I walked in, I saw my grandfather behind the counter, tugging and pulling. I worked the can out of my pocket and dumped it out in front of him and looked up. Grandpa was dumbfounded. He tried to say something, but it wouldn't come out. He looked at me and looked at the pile of coins. Finally, in a voice much louder than he ordinarily used, he asked, where did you get all this? I told you, Grandpa, I said. I was saving my money so I could buy two hound pups, and I did. You said you would order them for me. I've got the money, and now I want you to order them. Grandpa stared at me over his glasses and then back at the money. How long have you been saving this, he asked. A long time, Grandpa, I said. How long, he asked. I told him, two years. His mouth flew open, and in a loud voice, he said, two years? I nodded my head. The way my grandfather stared at me made me uneasy. It was on, I was on needles and pins. Taking his eyes from me, he glanced back at the money. He saw the faded yellow piece of paper sticking out from the coins. He worked it out, asking as he did, what's this? I told him it was the ad telling where to order my dogs. He read it, turned it over, and glanced at the other side. I saw the astonishment leave his eyes. Then friendly old grandfather... Then the friendly old grandfather look came back. I felt much better. Dropping the paper back in the money, he turned, picked up an old turkey feather duster, and started dusting where there was no dust. He kept glancing at me out of the corner of his eye as he walked slowly down to the other end of the store, dusting here and there. He put the duster down, came from behind the counter, and walked up to me. Laying a friendly old work calloused hand on my head, he changed the conversation altogether, saying, Son, you need a haircut. I told him I didn't mind. I didn't like my hair short. Flies and mosquitoes bothered me. He glanced down at my bare feet and asked, how come your feet are cut and scratched like that? I told him it was pretty tough picking blackberries barefoot. He nodded his head. It was too much for my grandfather. He turned and walked away. I saw the glasses come off and the old red, red handkerchief come out. I heard the good excuse of blowing his nose. He stood for several seconds with his back toward me. When he turned around, I noticed his eyes were moist. In a quavering voice, he said, Well, son, it's your money. You worked for it, and you worked hard. You got it honestly, and you want some dogs. We're going to get those dogs. Be damned, be damned. <clears throat> that was as near as I ever came to hear my grandfather curse, if you could call that cursing. He walked over and picked up the ad again, asking, is this two years old too? I nodded. Well, he said, the first thing we have to do is write this outfit. There may not even be a place like this in Kentucky anymore. After all, a lot of things can happen in two years. Seeing that I wor was worried, he said, now you go on home. I'll write to these kennels and I'll let you know when I get an answer. If we can get the dogs there, we can... If we can't get the dogs there, we can get them someplace else. And I don't think if I were you, I'd let my pa know anything about this right now. I happen to know he wants to buy that red mule from old man Potter. I told him I wouldn't and turned to leave the store. As I reached the door, my grandfather said in a loud voice, Say, it's been a long time since you've had any candy, hasn't it? I nodded my head. He asked, how long? I told him, a long time. Well, he said, we'll have to do something about that. Walking over behind the counter, he reached out and got a sack. I noticed it wasn't one of the nickel sacks. It was one of the quarter kind. So back in the day, oh, by the way, this is the early 1900s. But back in the day, you would go into a candy store and you'd get a paper sack. And you'd get, you know, the nickel sack, the dime sack, or the quarter sack. So now it's like, you know, eight bucks a pound for candy. It's crazy. My eyes never left my grandfather's hand. Time after time, it dipped in and out of the candy counter, peppermint sticks, jawbreakers, whorehound and gumdrops. The sack bulged, so did my eyes. Handing the sack to me, he said, here, first big coon you catch with those dogs, you can pay me back. I told him I would. On my way home, with a jawbreaker in one side of my mouth and a piece of whorehound in the other, I skipped and hopped, making half an effort to try to whistle and sing, and couldn't for the candy. 
I had the finest grandpa in the world and I was the happiest boy in the world. I wanted to share my happiness with my sisters, but decided not to say anything about ordering the pups. Arriving home, I dumped the sack of candy out on the bed. Six little hands helped themselves. I was well repaid by the love and adoration I saw in the wide blue eyes of my three little sisters. All right, so we know there's three little sisters now. And Grandpa, that's pretty cool. He's going to help him, you know, get his dogs or figure it out because he's right. In two years, I mean, a lot could have changed. So let's see what happens in chapter four. Chapter four, day after day, I flew to the store. Grandpa would shake his head. Then on a Monday, as I entered the store, I sensed a change in him. He was in high spirits, talking and laughing with half a dozen farmers. Every time I caught his eye, he would smile and wink at me. I thought the farmers would never leave, but finally the store was empty. Grandpa told me the letter had come. The kennels were still there and they had dogs for sale. He said he'd made the mail buggy wait while he made out the order. And another thing, the dog market had gone downhill. The price of the dogs had dropped $5. He handed me a $10 bill. Now there's still one stump in the way, he said. The mail buggy can't carry things like dogs. So they'll come as far as the depot at Tahlequah, but you'll get the notice here because I ordered them in your name. So he's talking about the train depot that we used to have in Tahlequah over a hundred years ago. I thanked my grandfather with all my heart and asked him how long I'd have to wait for the notice. He said, I don't know, but it shouldn't take more than a couple of weeks. I asked how I was going to get my dogs out from Tahlequah. Well, there's always someone going in, he said, and you could ride with them. That evening, the silence of our supper was interrupted when I asked my father the question, Papa, how far is it to Kentucky? I may as well have exploded a bomb. For an instant, there was complete silence, and then my oldest sister giggled. The two little ones stared at me. With a half-hearted laugh, my father said, Well, now, I don't know, but it's a pretty good ways. What do you want to know for? Thinking of taking a trip to Kentucky? No, I said, I just wondered. My youngest sister giggled and asked, can I go with you? I glared at her. Mama broke into the conversation. I declare, what kind of question is that? How far is it to Kentucky? I don't know what's gotten into that mind of yours lately. You go around like you were lost and you're losing weight. You're skinny as a rail. And just look at that hair. Just last Sunday, they had a haircutting over at the Tom Rollins place. But you couldn't go. You had to go prowling around the river in the woods. I told Mama that I'd get a haircut next time they had a cutting. And I just heard some fellows talking about Kentucky up at the store and wondered how far away it was. Much to my relief, the conversation was ended. So he's kind of, you know, he's lying here, a little white lie, but he doesn't want to get in trouble and probably doesn't want to get his grandpa in trouble. I'm inferring. The days dragged by. A week passed and still no word about my dogs. Terrible thoughts ran through my mind. Maybe my dogs were lost. The train had a wreck. Someone stole my money or perhaps the mailman lost my order. Then at the end of the second week, the notice came. My grandfather told me that he had talked to Jim Hodges that day. He was going into town in about a week and I could ride in with him to pick up my dogs. Again, I thanked my grandfather. I started for home. Walking along in deep thought, I decided it was time to tell my father the whole story. I fully intended to tell him that evening. I tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. I wasn't scared of him, for he never whipped me. He was always kind and gentle, but for some reason, I don't know why, I just couldn't tell him. That night, snuggled deep in the soft folds of a feather bed, I lay thinking. I had waited so long for my dogs, and so desperately, I wanted to see them and hold them. I didn't want to wait a whole week. In a flash, I made up my mind. Very quietly, I got up and put on my clothes. I sneaked into the kitchen and got one, one of Mama's precious flour sacks. In it, I put six eggs, some leftover cornbread, a little salt, and a few matches. Next, I went to the smokehouse and cut off a piece of salt pork. I stopped at the barn and picked up a gunny sack. I put the flour sack inside the gunny sack. This I rolled up and crammed lengthwise in the bib of my overalls. I was on my way. I was going after my dogs. Tahlequah was a small country town with a population of about 800. By the road, it was 32 miles away, but as the crow flies, it was only 20 miles. 
I went as the crow flies straight through the hills. Although I had never been to town in my life, I knew what direction to take. Tahlequah had the railroad. Tahlequah and the railroad lay on the other side of the river from our place. I had the Frisco Railroad on my right and the Illinois River on my left. Not far from where the railroad crossed the river lay the town of Tahlequah. I knew if I bore to the right, I would find the railroad, and if I bore to the left, I had the river to guide me. Sometime that night, I crossed the river on the riffle somewhere in the Dripping Springs country. Coming out of the river bottoms, I scattered up along the hogback ridge and broke out on top of the flats. In a mile-eating trot, I moved along. I had the wind of the deer, the muscles of a country boy, and a heart full of dog love and a strong determination. I wasn't scared of the darkness or the mountains, for I was raised in these mountains. On and on, mile after mile, I moved along. I saw faint gray streaks appear in the east. I knew daylight was close. My bare feet were getting sore from the flint rocks and saw briars. I stopped behind a mountain stream and soaked my feet in the cool water, rested for a spell, and then started on. After leaving the mountain stream, my pace was much slower. The muscles of my legs were getting stiff. Feeling the pangs of hunger gnawing at my stomach, I decided I would stop and eat at the next stream I found. Then I remembered I'd forgotten to include a can in which to boil my eggs. I stopped and built a small fire. Cutting off a nice thick slab of salt pork, I roasted it and with a piece of cornbread made a sandwich. Putting out my fire, I was on my way again. I ate as I trotted along. I felt much better. I came to Tahlequah from the northeast at the outskirts of town. I hid my flour sack and provisions, keeping the gunny sack. I walked into town. I was scared of Tahlequah and the people. I had never seen such a big town and so many people. There was store after store. Some of them had two stories high. The wagon yard had wagons on top of wagons, teams, buggies, and horses. Two young ladies about my age stopped, stared at me, and then giggled. My blood boiled, but I could understand. After all, I had three sisters. They couldn't help it because they were women folks. I went on. That's um, very condescending to women. Again, this book was written a long time ago. I saw a big man coming up the street. The bright, shiny star on his vest looked as big as a bucket. I saw the long black gun at his side and I froze in my tracks. I had heard of sheriffs and marshals, but I had never seen one. Stories repeated about them in the mountains told how fast they were with a gun and how many men they had killed. The closer he came, the more frightened I got. I knew it was the end for me. I could just see him aiming his big black gun and shooting me between the eyes. It seemed like a miracle that passed by, hardly glancing at me. Breathing a sigh, I walked on, seeing the wonders of the world. Passing a large door window, I stopped and stared. There in the window was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Everything under the sun, overalls, jackets, bolts of beautiful cloth, new harnesses, collars, bridles, and then my eyes did pop open. There were several guns, and one of them had two barrels. I couldn't believe it, two barrels. I had seen several guns, but never one with two barrels. Then I saw something else. The sun was just right, and the plate glass was a perfect mirror. I saw the full reflection of myself for the first time in my life. He'd never looked at himself in a mirror. That's what he's saying. I could see that I did look a little odd. My straw-colored hair was long and shaggy and was bushed out like a corn tassel that had been hit by the wind. I tried to smooth it down with my hands. This helped some, but not much. What it needed was a good combing, and I had no comb. My overalls were patched and faded, but they were clean. My shirt had pulled out. I tucked it back in. I took one look at my bare feet and winced. They were as brown as a dead sycamore leaf. The spiderweb pattern of raw red scratches looked odd in the saddle brown skin. I thought, well, I won't have to pick any more blackberries and the scratches will go away. I pumped up one of my arms and thought surely the muscle was going to pop right through my thin blue shirt. I stuck out my tongue. It was as red as pokeberry juice and anything that color was supposed to be healthy. After making a few faces at myself, I put my thumbs in my ears and was making mule ears when two old women came by. They stopped and stared at me. I stared back. As they turned to go their way, I heard one of them say something to the other. The words were hard to catch, but I did hear one word, wild. 
As I said before, they couldn't help it. They were women folks. As I turned to leave, my eyes again fell on the overalls and the bolts of cloth. I thought of my mother, father, and sisters. Here was an opportunity to make amends for leaving home without telling anyone. I entered the store. I bought a pair of overalls for Papa. After telling the storekeeper how big my mother's and sister's were, I bought several yards of cloth. I also bought a large sack of candy. Glancing down at my bare feet, the storekeeper said, I have some good shoes. I told him I didn't need any shoes. He asked if that would be all. I nodded. He added up the bill. I handed him my $10. He gave me my change. After wrapping up the bundles, he helped me put them in my sack. Lifting it to my shoulder, I turned and left the store. Out on the street, I picked out a friendly looking old man and asked him where the train depot was. He told me to go down to the last street and turn right, go as far as I could, and I couldn't miss it. I thanked him and started on my way. Leaving the main part of town, I started up the long street through the, re through the residential area. I had never seen so many beautiful houses, and they were all different colors. The lawns were neat and clean and looked like green carpets. I saw a man pushing some kind of mowing machine. I stopped to watch the whirling blades. He gawked at me like, you know looked at him weird. I hurried on. I heard a lot of shouting and laughing ahead of me. Not wanting to miss anything, I walked a little faster. I saw what was making the noise. More kids than I had ever seen were playing around a big red brick building. I thought some rich man lived there and was giving a party for his children. Walking up to the edge of the playground, I stopped to watch. The boys and girls were about my age and were as thick as flies around the sorghum mill. They were milling, running, and jumping. Teeter-totters and swings were loaded down with them. Everyone was laughing and having a big time. Over against the building, a large blue pipe ran up an angle from the ground. A few feet from the top, there was a bend in it. The pipe seemed to go into the building. Boys were crawling into its dark mouth. I counted nine of them. One boy stood about six feet from the opening with a stick in his hand. Staring Google-eyed, trying to figure out what they were doing, I got a surprise. Out of the hollow pipe spurted a boy. He sailed through the air and lit on his feet. The boy with the stick marked the ground where he landed. All nine of them came shooting out, one behind the other. As each boy landed, a new mark was scratched. They ganged around looking at the lines. There was a lot of loud talking, pointing, and arguing. Then all the lines were erased and a new scorekeeper was picked out. The others crawled back into the pipe. I figured out how the game was played. After climbing to the top of the slide, the boys turned around and sat down. One at a time, they came flying down and out feet first. The one that shot out the furthest was the winner. I thought how wonderful it would be if I could slide down just one time. One boy spying me standing on the corner came over, looking me up and down. He asked, do you go to school here? I said, school? He said, sure, school. What did you think it was? Oh, no, I don't go to school here. Do you go to Jefferson? No, I don't go there either. Do you go to school at all? Sure, I go to school. Where? At home. You go to school at home? I nodded. What grade are you in? I said I wasn't in any grade. Puzzled, he said. You go to school at home and you don't know what grade you're in. Who teaches you? My mother. What does she teach you? I said, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and I bet I'm just as good as you are, he asked. Don't you have any shoes? I said, sure, I have shoes. Why aren't you wearing them? I don't ever wear shoes until it gets cold. He laughed and asked where I lived. I said, back in the hills. He said, oh, you're a hillbilly. He ran back to the mob. I saw him pointing at me and talking to several boys. They started my way yelling, hillbilly, hillbilly. Not nice. Just before they reached me, a bell started ringing. Turning, they ran to the front of the building, lined up in two long lines, and marching like little tin soldiers disappeared inside the school. The playground was silent. I was all alone and felt lonely and sad. I heard a noise on my right. I didn't have to turn around to recognize what it was. Someone was using a hoe. I'd know that sound if I heard it on a dark night. It was a little old white-headed woman working in a flower bed. Looking again at the long blue pipe, I thought, there's no one around. Maybe I could have one slide anyway. I eased over and looked up into the dark hollow. It looked scary, 
but I thought of all the other boys I had seen crawl into it. I could see the last mark on the ground and thought, I bet I can beat that. Laying my sack down, I started climbing up. The farther I went, the darker and more scary it got. Just as I reached the top, my feet slipped. Down I sailed. All the way down, I tried to grab onto something, but there was nothing to grab. I'm sure some great champions had slid out of that pipe, and no doubt more than one world record had been broken. But if someone had been there when I came out, I know the record I set would stand today in all its glory. I came out just like I went in, feet first and belly down. My legs were spread out like a bean shooter stalk. Arms flailing in the air, I zoomed down and up. I screamed to hang suspended in the air at the peak of my climb. I could see the hard packed ground far below. As I started down, I shut my eyes tight and gritted my teeth. This didn't seem to help. With a splattering sound, I landed. I felt the air whoosh out between my teeth. I tried to scream, but I had no wind left to make a sound, so it knocked the wind out of him. After bouncing a couple of times, I finally settled down to earth. I lay spread eagle for a few seconds and slowly got to my knees. Hearing loud laughter, I looked around. It was the little old lady with the hoe in her hand. She hollered and asked how I liked it. Without answering, I grabbed my gunny sack and left. Far up the street, I looked back. The little old lady was sitting down, rocking with laughter. I couldn't understand these town people. If they weren't staring at a fellow, they were laughing at him. And that's the end of chapter four. So he's made it into the big town of Tahlequah with 800 people. I'm not sure how many people we have now or what our population is, but it would be interesting to look it up and see how much we've grown in 100 years. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, we'll pick up tomorrow with chapter five. And like I said, we'll, we, we will read one chapter a day till we get to the very end in April. So have a wonderful, terrific Tuesday and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Bye.